On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, Consumer Reports offers new data that shows just how affordable Teslas are to own through the first decade of ownership. The Cybertruck gets a pricey new accessory. Tesla's craziest new supercharger location makes notable construction progress and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey alongside Daisy the Boxer to my left, and just immediately to my left, below here on the floor, chilling out on a pillow, is mine of the future service dog puppy. Welcome to Ride the Lightning. It's your weekly Tesla unofficial podcast. This one's episode 472 for August 18th, 2024. And I start here with the Cybertruck this week. Let's get things warmed up. The Cybertruck's range extender, which I feel like I just mentioned Gosh, one or two episodes back, I was talking or something along the lines of, we haven't heard anything about it in a while. Well, we now have. It's back in the news a little bit. And that news is that it's been delayed, but seemingly only by just a little bit. As noticed by eagle-eyed Tesla tipster Sawyer Merritt, the Cybertruck page on the Tesla.com website now shows the ETA for the range extender as early 2025. So not much of a bump from the late 2024 that had been showing for the past, what, nine months or so now, but a little bit of a delay nevertheless. I know that some of you Foundation Series Cybertruck owners did put down a $500 non-refundable deposit on the range extender when you ordered your truck, so hopefully the range extender doesn't get pushed out any further, and those of you that have put down that deposit can get that range extender installed in the near term future. Hopefully six months or less at this point would be the the hope now that we're into mid-August. The Patreon poll question for this week is about the Cybertruck range extender. You know, every week I like to go through the podcast after I've halfway through preparing it or so, because I usually put the poll up on Tuesday. And I thought, okay, well, what, what's a good poll question for this week? And, well, when I saw that range extender thing, I thought, well, this is a good thing to check in with the audience on. So this week's Patreon poll question was, Cybertruck buyers, present or future, does the range extender interest you? 38% of you said, no, I'll wait until Tesla can deliver about 500 miles of range and a full six-foot long bed. Another 32% of you that voted said no because I don't want a third of my bed taken up. 12% of you said maybe, but I want to hear about how performance and bed usage are affected in the real world first. Practically the same number of folks, 11% said yes, but not for $16,000. And just 6% of poll responders said yes. I want that 470 miles of range, and I am willing to pay the $16,000 asking price. Thank you to everybody that took the time to vote. And a reminder, too, that you do not have to be backing me. You don't have to be supporting the podcast on Patreon to vote in the poll each week. The poll is open to everyone. So swing on by. Like I said, usually it's Tuesday nights when the new poll question goes up. And you can cruise on over to patreon.com slash Podcast to vote in each week's poll. So at the moment, as the case would be before most of us have taken delivery of our Cybertrucks, most people not interested in the range extender for one reason or another, whether it's because it takes up bed space, whether it's the cost, what have you, not too many people showing interest in it yet. So we'll see if that changes as time goes on and these get out there and people start sharing real-world experience of what it's like to have one in your truck. And then, really, the other piece of it would be, as more of us get Cybertrucks, we'll kind of see how, you know, people go, oh, you know what, actually, I think I do want that range extender. We'll see if that happens. Next up this week, speaking of the Cybertruck, there is a new accessory in the online Tesla shop. It is a Cybertruck cooler for the front trunk, the frunk, 
Here's the description from the Tesla online shop page. It says, Keep your food and drinks cold on the road at your campsite or away from home with the Cybertruck cooler. Inspired by the durable, angular design of Cybertruck, this cooler is designed to fit perfectly in the front trunk of your Cybertruck. Made with premium stainless steel cladding and high-quality insulation to keep perishables cold and ice frozen for days at a time. The stats on this, as I'm sure you'll want to know, it's big, it holds 56 quarts, which is 90 canned beverages, according to Tesla. It weighs 31 pounds empty, and it does not take up the entire frunk, if you're curious. And it's also got the Cybertruck triangle silhouette logo embossed or engraved, whatever the case may be, on the top of it. And if you're wondering, no, it's not powered, because there are powered coolers out there. So given all that I've just told you, I'd like you to now take a guess at what you think this costs. Big cooler, holds lots of stuff, stainless steel cladding, fits in the frunk. It's heavy. <laughs> it, it's not powered. Did you guess 700 bucks? Because that's how much it costs. Oh boy. Well, as always, these things are worth what people are willing to pay for them. We have seen Tesla overcharge before, at least I say overcharge according to the market, and my evidence to back that up is, I'll give you two, two pieces of evidence here, with the lighted door sill plates that actually I have in my car, I bought them at, at when they were at full price, their max price, <laughs> I believe they were $250 when they first went up on the online Tesla shop, now they're $200. I'll give you an even bigger example, more, uh, more sort of a bigger gap example. The carbon fiber wheel cap kit for the 19 or 20 inch sport wheels on the old Model 3, they're still available. They were, I believe, I actually couldn't find the original price of these, but I think they were $350. They were definitely over $300, 300 or more. They are now $175 because clearly people... Not a lot of people bought them. So this cooler, to me, as somebody that plans to buy a Cybertruck, is insanely expensive. I went and looked it up. There are third-party options for the other cars that fit, that are custom fit for either the frunk or the rear lower trunk well, like, you know, your sub trunk in your Model 3 or your Model Y, for a fraction of this price. A fraction. And I suspect that before too long, there will be third-party cooler options for a Cybertruck frunk cooler as well that will also probably be a fraction of this price. I should also give you a friendly reminder that the Cybertruck kind of already has this built into it. The sub-trunk on the Cybertruck, which is, of course, located in the bed. There's a panel there that lifts up. You can use that as a cooler. You can fill it with ice, put drinks, whatever in there. And there's even a drain plug. So it's it's actually designed for that. It's built into the truck. Now, the third party options, if you do want to go that route and have something that goes in the frunk, will those third party options be skinned in stainless steel? Well, probably not. But they would get the job done. And again, probably for a fraction of the price. From what I can see in the product description and the photos on the Tesla website, this thing doesn't even have handles or a carrying strap. So it's effectively a two-person job to move it when it's full. If not, like if you can manage the weight, that's one thing. But even if you can do that, it's going to be the, the bulk and then the heft combined with the weight. So... This one, yeah, this one would not be high on my list of recommended accessories for a Cybertruck. But again, it's just my opinion. If you'd like one, go for it. You do have to have a Cybertruck VIN on your Tesla account in order to buy one of these, though, just like all of the other vehicle-specific accessories. So you can't just buy one in anticipation of getting your Cybertruck. You need to have that VIN on your account before Tesla will let you buy one. Next up this week as we get things warmed up, 
what will almost certainly be Tesla's new flagship supercharging station. Now, it won't be the biggest in terms of number of stalls, but it'll be probably, in my humble opinion, the coolest one, not in temperature, but in cool factor. Well, it just got one step closer to completion. It took an important step this week. I'm talking, of course, about the drive-in diner in Hollywood. Here's an update from Drive Tesla Canada, who writes, Tesla's Hollywood Diner and Supercharger Project, which broke ground last September at 7001 Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood, has been years in the making. Plans reveal the company is building a unique destination for Tesla owners, including a two-story restaurant with seating for over 200 diners and a separate theater area that accommodates up to 77 guests. Those guests and Tesla owners plugged in at one of the supercharger posts will be able to watch movies on two towering 45-foot LED screens located in the parking lot. It has now been nearly a year since construction first began, and as the building is getting closer to completion, Tesla has published its first job opening for the diner. According to the job posting, seeking a Tesla Diner Experience Specialist on LinkedIn and shared by Jeff on X, the company is seeking individuals to help develop and test pre-opening programs, manage the drive-in movie schedule and audiovisual systems, collaborate on menu changes, and more. The job description also says these successful applicants will coordinate with the Tesla merchandise team, suggesting there will be a merchandise shop in the diner as well. Quote from the job app, Seeking an individual who is passionate about providing unparalleled and immersive customer experience for charging and dining. And the position has a salary range of, and this is in American dollars here, because it's from Drive Tesla Canada, so that's why I wanted to clarify that. It's from US $83,600 all the way up to $285,000, which immediately has me wondering if I should quit my job, move to Los Angeles, and run the Tesla drive-in diner in Hollywood. I mean, it would be kind of cool to do this, do the podcast out of there every week. No, I'm kidding. But first of all, if you're in the LA area and are seriously interested in that job, go on LinkedIn and apply. Do it. And secondly, I will say that it's definitely a good sign that this is getting close to completion if they're starting to interview applicants and hire employees to staff it. As I've said before, I'm most curious about the food situation. Are they going to hire an executive chef? Is it going to be legitimately good food? As I've mentioned the last time, whatever the last time this came up, you know, I, I have to wonder, will, will the food be themed? Like, will there be a plaid burger? And well, what do I mean by a plaid burger? How about a burger available in beef or impossible vegan meat that has a plaid logo seared into the top of the patty, right? That would be fun. That would be a fun way to theme it. So that's just one example. I am just so eager to hear more about this very, very special supercharger, most notably the menu. And when it does open, I can't wait to make a trip down there to go visit it. Before I continue with what is plenty more news in this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, I wanted to mention that I hope all of you who are kindly supporting the podcast on Patreon at that $10 per month tier or higher enjoyed this week's Lightning Round mini episode, which was about whether or not I think the Foundation Series Cybertrucks might be worth anything extra down the road by virtue of being foundation series. So I went through, made an argument for it with a few different points. So if you're interested in hearing that and you're already supporting me on Patreon at that $10 per month tier or higher, you can find that on my Patreon page, which of course is patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. And if you're not already supporting me on Patreon, but you get a lot of the podcast each week and you think, you know what, Ryan? Yes, I'd like to support you and I'd like to get access to all 107, I think, now I'm losing count, over 100 of those lightning rounds, you can jump on the Patreon and join. You can support the podcast. I would be humbled and grateful if you would consider a pledge. There are different pledge tiers. It's not just 
that $10 per month tier. The support tier start at just five bucks a month, and that'll get you early access to each week's episode. But if you step up to that most popular tier, that's that $10 per month tier, you'll get not only the early access to each week's episode, but you'll also get access to all of those lightning round mini episodes that I do every single week on Patreon. So one more time, visit patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. Don't forget that there's a 10% discount if you do the annual pledge, pledging once to support for an entire year. And there's a free seven day trial option available as well on that $10 per month tier. So check those out. Now, the headline story this week, Tesla vehicles cost the least to maintain, according to Consumer Reports. This chart was posted by Tesla on their official X account, and it reads, cheapest brands to maintain long term. Consumer Reports writing, to better understand how costs increase over time and differ by brand, in its 2023 annual auto survey, Consumer Reports asked members how much they paid out of pocket for maintenance and repairs during the previous 12 months. The years below refer to the age of their vehicles. So it's broken into a one to five year cost, a six to 10 year cost, and then a total. Tesla finishing number one by a lot. Tesla costing an average of $4,035 over a decade with just $580 of that in the first five years, $3,455 coming in years six through 10. Number two, if you were to guess who finished second on this, I think many of us would have made the same guess, and that probably would be Toyota. That would be incorrect, believe it or not, Buick. Buick at number two on this list, but still well behind Tesla, $4,900 total for Buick with $900 in the first five years and another $4,000 in the the second five years, years six through 10. Toyota was third, actually, well, I, I should say tied for second. So you know what? If you guessed Toyota, you were technically correct. Toyota was higher on years one through five, but also lower on years six through 10. And then it's Lincoln, then Ford, Chevy, Hyundai, Nissan, Mazda. And all the way at the bottom of the list is Land Rover. Now, let me just just compare. I'm not trying to pick on Land Rover, but just to illustrate the difference between number one and last. It's, uh, again, Tesla is a total cost to maintain $4,035 over 10 years. Land Rover, $19,250. So you're talking almost five times higher on the Land Rover. And again, it's even when you're comparing number one to number two, it's not even close. So again, a, a quick shout out to Buick for tying Toyota. Toyota certainly has the reputation, but sounds like Buick maybe deserves a little of that reputation as well, at least when it comes to gasoline powered cars. Tesla is nearly 20% better than Buick and Toyota. They have the lowest one through five year cost and the lowest year six through year 10 cost. And here's the thing. I would be willing to place a friendly wager that the six to 10 year number for Tesla will go down in the coming two, three, five years, if not even keep going down further than that. Because right now, the Model S and the Model X are basically the only Teslas in that six to 10 year range. And those older S's and X's are simply not as reliable as newer S's and X's, let alone the simpler Model 3's and Model Y's because in addition to the simplification that Tesla has implemented across its vehicle lineup, but especially in the three and the Y compared to the S and the X, Tesla's just gotten way better at manufacturing. So these cars are more reliable than they were, than you know, than the early S's and X's were seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. And I suppose 
Yes, technically the oldest Model 3s are seven years old at this point, but there are very few of those seven-year-old Model 3s right now because what I'm talking about there are the 2017 models that only went to Tesla employees at the time and production was super slow in those first six months of the that, that were the 2017 models. So, real or say first five months because the it was end of July that the first Model 3s came out in 2017. By the way, uh, again, I don't want to pick on Land Rover, but if you're curious who else is at the bottom, I'm not again, I'm not trying to to kick anybody while they're down here, but I only point this out because the Germans are known for their excellent engineering, but the Germans are who's at the bottom of the list, just above Land Rover, who's way, way worse than than the next worst, which is Porsche. So it's from if you go from the bottom, it's Land Rover, then it's Porsche, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, and BMW, all the German brands which I would never have guessed because, again, the German car companies have a really good reputation for building good quality cars. But anyway, um, this, I think, well, first of all, for the Germans, it's hopefully going to get better as those brands electrify because all of them are embracing electrification. So as those brands electrify, hopefully their numbers will get better. And just pivoting back to Tesla now, This is another data point that you can direct somebody to if they're doubting Tesla or maybe even more optimistically, if it's not a FUD situation, if they're just wondering whether or not to buy one. If they're considering it, they're on the fence, they're talking to you about yours, you can point to this and say, hey, Consumer Reports just did a a whole thing that named Tesla as the cheapest brand to maintain long term. And if you say, if you don't believe me, go look it up on Consumer Reports. So Tesla has not only the cheapest maintenance costs, but remember, we all know very well the cheapest fuel costs as well because they're pure battery electric vehicles. Next up this week, this one took me by surprise. I will say I would not have ever guessed this, but here we go. Tesla has introduced a new textile interior option exclusively for the Model 3 in Mexico. And it's specific to the Model 3 rear-wheel drive, the base Model 3. Another tip of the cap here to Sawyer Merritt, that's where I saw this, he posted on X, noting that this vehicle includes gray textile seats and standard features. It is now the only interior option available on the base Model 3 for the Mexico market. Here are the rest of the changes. No heated or ventilated seats in front or rear. Again, the new Model 3, the 3 Fresh in the U.S. and everywhere else in the world has heated and ventilated seats. So no heated or ventilated seats in front or rear. The rear seat screen has been removed. The, for the ambient lighting, that strip of light that runs around the entire cabin that you can customize the color of on the touchscreen? Well, you can't customize it. It is still there on this Mexico Model 3, but it's white light only. It's just a a strip of white light all the time that runs around the interior. The steering wheel is not heated. And as far as acoustic glass go, well, you only get it on the front windows, whereas the 3 Fresh has, in, in every other market, has the acoustic glass all around the car. So just to super clarify, the same Model 3, the base Model 3 in the US and Canada, meaning the rest of North America, still gets everything. This is only for Mexico at the moment. And as I said at the top of this story, this is, to me, quite unexpected and also very interesting. If you've been closely following everything about the Model 3 since the very beginning, you might remember that textile seats, fabric seats, were originally planned to be in the standard range Model 3 before Tesla scrapped that plan and instead sold the standard range as a software downgraded standard range plus. In fact, no Tesla 
S3, X, or Y has had a cloth seat since the reasonably early Model S days. Not like crazy early, but it's been a long time since any Tesla was built and sold with a textile seat in it. And the question that I find myself asking here is why? Or I guess more specifically, why just Mexico? So is Tesla testing it in this market to see if the sales are negatively affected by this change? And if they're not, they'll make it a global thing? And I suspect that's exactly what it is. I I would be willing to make one of my patented In-N-Out Burger lunch bets on this. I think that's exactly what it is because as I've said on this podcast, ever since the long range rear wheel drive Model 3 returned and with it, it's tax credit eligible on that variant, while as we know, the base Model 3 with the LFP battery continues to sit there without a tax credit, thus actually making it more expensive, unless you just don't qualify for the tax credit. I have said I thought that the base model might just go away and the long range rear wheel drive becomes the base model. Well, now I'm wondering if Tesla takes this stripped down base model three from Mexico and goes global with it, well, it might allow them to lower the price a significant amount. Does stripping out all of those interior components that I just mentioned, would that let Tesla lower the price enough to get it below the post tax credit price on that long range rear wheel drive? Which as a reminder, that long range rear wheel drive three is 35,000 out the door if you qualify for the tax credit. It's 425, so it's 35 out the door with the tax credit. And so, could this Mexico base model three be a $33,000 car if it comes to the US? If so, well that would be shaving $5,000 off of the current base model's price It's a $38,000 car right now if you go to order one. And if we take a look at the the bigger picture here, the macro on this, we know that Tesla is struggling a little bit to sell cars right now, as is everyone. So I think that this could very well be a bold move to bring the price down ahead of the Model 2.5 and just make the cars more affordable for more people. I mean, let's say that my hypothesis is correct, including my guess at the price. So I have to ask then, okay, in this thought exercise, would this Model 3 be a good value at $33,000? No heated seats, no heated steering wheel, no ventilated seats, no second row screen, all that stuff. Would would this Model 3 be a good value at 33K? And I have to unequivocally say, Yes, 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 yes. Because 272 miles of daily usable range, thanks to that LFP battery pack, is a lot of daily usable range. You'd get great software, of course, awesome Tesla software, the best safety in the industry, as is on every Tesla, and, well, Sawyer didn't happen to mention, or I suppose the information wasn't necessarily available, if this... Mexico Model 3 will lack basic autopilot or not. But I I have to say, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Or, if it were to be the case, should Tesla roll this car out in the US? So we'll see. We'll see what levers Tesla pulls here. And I have to say, I'm going to make a, maybe a somewhat bold prediction. Although, okay, I won't go so far as to make it a prediction. I'll say this. Don't be surprised if we see this Model 3 roll out in the US in the fourth quarter, which by the way, is only two months out. Because if Tesla's numbers continue to be down, they I could absolutely see them making this car available in the US for a, the, make it the most affordable Tesla ever for that big Q4 shopping season where te- Tesla typically sells the most cars out of any quarter in the year. So stay tuned on this one. 
Next up this week, Tesla's filed a lawsuit against EVject, which is an aftermarket safety escape connector maker that's received some, some reasonable acclaim and appreciation in the EV community. In Tesla's complaint, they claimed that the escape connector poses a high safety risk and has harmed Tesla's brand. I saw this story written up on Teslarati, so I want to give them a tip of the cap. They write, as per the product's official website, the EVject device allows drivers to disconnect and drive away from a supercharger without leaving the inside of their car. The connector's breakaway feature also helps keep a Tesla's charge port and the supercharger plug from getting damaged during a getaway. EVject has thus become widely appreciated by EV owners, especially women and young drivers, some of whom have noted that some late night supercharging sessions have made them feel unsafe. Tesla, however, argued in its lawsuit that EVject is falsely marketing its product as safe, noting the product's lack of over temperature prote protection, pardon me, creates a safety risk. As per Tesla's lawsuit, which was filed in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California, quote, In the event of an over-temperature condition in the connector, the lack of over-temperature protection creates a safety risk. Testing of high-current simulated charging through the connector, utilized in conjunction with a Tesla supercharger cable and Tesla EV charge port, demonstrated that surface temperatures of the connector may reach as high as 100 degrees Celsius after 30 minutes of charging at 420 ADC. During an over-temperature event, a user of the connector may be burned during or following charging by touching or grabbing the connector. Additionally, the high temperature present in the connector poses a risk of fire and ignition of other combustible materials in the charger cable, the vehicle connected to the, to the connector, and the supercharger infrastructure, Tesla noted. Tesla's lawsuit against EVject has been received with polarizing reactions from the EV community. Some who support the EV maker's legal, legal action have noted on social media that EVject's product pitch f creates fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Supporters of the aftermarket escape connector, however, have argued that instead of suing EVject, Tesla should instead work with the aftermarket accessory maker to make sure that its product is safe. So just to paint a clearer picture of what this adapter does, if that explanation didn't quite clarify it, it would allow you to just drive away from a supercharger while plugged in if you found yourself in an unsafe situation and didn't want to get out of the car to unplug the cable yourself. So personally, I have to say, I think I'm with the camp of people who'd like to see Tesla work with EVject in order to ensure a safe product, because I really believe that there's a market need for this. You want everybody to feel safe at a supercharger, be it women, young people, older people, anybody else. Now, I recognize that having a piping hot adapter is a really bad thing, not just for the consumer, but from Tesla's perspective as well. I totally get it. I acknowledge that as a company, Tesla being a company with a sterling reputation for safety, well, they didn't want to wait for a real life bad situation to happen with an EVject adapter before they took action here. But unless Tesla's already developing something similar themselves, it is my hope that they will work with EVject and not just sue them to stop them. Again, Tesla's got a, a, a beef here. I do recognize that, but I think the, the greater good would be for Tesla to cooperate and, or if they're not gonna cooperate, to make an accessory themselves to, that they can make available, that's warranted, that's a, official, that's a first party accessory. So in this lawsuit, here's to cooler heads and cooler charging cables prevailing. And sorry, that was, that was a lame joke, but I couldn't help myself. Before I continue with, let's see, I've still got a couple more stories this week. I want to mention a couple friends of Ride the Lightning. The clock is rapidly 
ticking here. The, the sands of the hourglass are running out. Whatever time-based analogy that you want to use, the Tesla raffle, the 10th annual Chesed Chicago Tesla raffle is back. You may remember this one. I've been mentioning it not only just last year, but for the last month or so this year. You can win a Tesla, any of them, and yes, that includes the Cybertruck, or you could choose $50,000 cash if you win. The proceeds here go to a great cause. It's Hesed Chicago, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping families in crisis. They are funding over 80 programs and services right now, and their goal is helping families get back on their feet by offering goods and services like food and furniture, job placement, navigating government funding, and much more. So for your chance to win this raffle, again, it's only, it ends in very early September, so you've got just a couple of weeks yet yet to go. Head on over to ccraffle.com. You can purchase tickets there. And if you elect to purchase two tickets, you can get $25 off of those two tickets by using the promo code RTL. So the tickets are limited. Only 9,999 will be sold. So if that happens sooner than the than early September, well, then it'll just be over. So that's why you got to move sooner rather than later. If you've been hearing me talk about this recently and you're thinking, oh yeah, that could be cool. Now is the time to go ahead and purchase those tickets. Use that promo code RTL to get $25 off of two tickets or... If you want to buy 15 tickets and really increase those chances to win, that same promo code RTL will get you $500 off of those 15 tickets. So I hope one of you wins one of those Teslas. If you do, I'd love to interview you and find out which one you chose first and foremost. I have to guess that a lot of you are going to choose, or a lot of you would choose the Cybertruck if you won, but... I know it's the Cybertruck doesn't fit everybody, and not necessarily everybody's out there looking for a Cybertruck. But anyway, ccraffle.com, promo code RTL. Also, Accelerate Auto and the X-Care Extended Warranty Option. Get yours at X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E-A-U-T-O dot com slash X-C-A-R-E. Use the promo code LIGHTNING for $100 off your purchase. And if you're thinking, well, what's my purchase? You can make it, you can make your extended warranty policy pretty much anything you want. If you want to cover the car bumper to bumper, but not the battery and drivetrain, there's that sort of general extended warranty policy. If you want to do just the battery and drivetrain, you can do that. If you want to do both, you can do that. And then in terms of how many miles, how many years, that's all up to you. I have a three-year, 40,000-mile extended warranty plan with Accelerate Auto. That's my X-Care plan. You can go up to 10 years, up to 125,000 miles of additional coverage. So check them out. Again, the website, I spelled it out, so I'll just say it real quick here. AccelerateAuto.com slash X-Care and that discount code for $100 off your policy purchase good everywhere except Florida. Apologies to Florida. It's a state law thing. The discount code is lightning for that $100 off discount. Getting back to the news this week. Got a couple more stories to talk about. Speaking of superchargers, Tesla dominated J.D. Power's 2024 electric vehicle experience public chart. Wow, what a mouthful that study is. Electric Vehicle Experience Public Charging. That is that needs to be renamed. We can let's we can do better, guys. We can we can come up with a better name. Anyway, JD Power surveying their audience on which fast charging EV experience is the best. You already know who won, and it's not even particularly close. I saw this again written up on Tesla Roddy, so one more tip of the cap to them. They write, Tesla's supercharging network once again flexed its muscles on the rest of its competitors by outpacing and outperforming names like ChargePoint, EVgo, and Electrify America. And there is a chart here as well that I'll read to you. We've got 
an overall customer satisfaction index ranking. It's based on a 1,000 point scale, Tesla superchargers scoring 731 on that 1,000 point scale. The segment average, which Tesla brings up, don't forget, Tesla's raising that average. The segment average is 664. So even with Tesla lifting the average, they're still well above it because everybody else is below that average. Charge point scoring 627 out of 1,000. EV Go, 566. And just behind them, Electrify America at 559 points on that customer satisfaction index ranking. Furthermore, Brett, uh, pardon me, Brent Gruber, the executive director of the electric vehicle experience at J.D. Power, explained the study's findings saying, quote, Overall, both Tesla and non-Tesla owners find charging their vehicles at Tesla supercharger facilities is most satisfying. Non-Tesla owners, like those with EVs from Ford or Rivian, who now have access to the supercharger network, appreciate the ability to charge at the broad network of Tesla chargers that was previously unavailable to them. Despite the recent influx of non-Tesla vehicles into the supercharger facilities, which has caused some grumbling, Tesla owners still appreciate the ease of charging and ease of payment that the network offers. However, since the beginning of the year, JD Power ha has seen a decline in satisfaction with the availability of superchargers among Tesla owners, which is certainly no doubt a result of the other cars being allowed onto the network and just many more Teslas being pumped out on a weekly basis as well. But the overall ranking of Tesla here, meaning number one by a mile, will come as absolutely no surprise to anybody listening to this podcast. And while I do want to celebrate the good and not pick on anybody here, it would unfortunately seem that Electrify America's poor reputation is not undeserved. And you know, that's a real shame because they are, of course, one of the bigger non-Tesla players in the U.S. fast charging market. In fact, if not the biggest of the non-Teslas, and they were, as you'll remember, set up as Volkswagen's punishment for Dieselgate. So it was a good thing born out of a bad thing. It's just not there yet. And so I really hope that Electrify America is going to improve things because we need all of these services, not just Tesla, not just Electrify America. We need all of them to be good in order for the EV movement to be as successful and as to do so as quickly as possible. But getting back to Tesla here, this right here, supercharging, has become, I mean, it's always been, but it's really become one of Tesla's biggest advantages. It really always has, we all know that, but now that there are some legitimate alternative EVs on the market that somebody might actually cross shop a Tesla against, it's really become a primary differentiator between, say, a Rivian and a Tesla or a Ford and a Tesla, whatever the case may be. Now, this, along with a better range to price ratio, in other words, more range for the same money, to me, I think those are the two biggest standout features that Tesla can lord over the competition, that, that if somebody's considering an EV, and you just look at Tesla, the supercharging experience, the fast charging experience is clearly way better by any metric in terms of number of chargers, convenience of chargers, reliability of chargers, all of it. So it's that and it's that range to price ratio. Teslas just offer more range for the same money or in some cases more range for less money, which is pretty wild as well. Although, I would throw in one other one here, and that's software. Because Tesla's software is just so much better than just about every other EV out there. In fact, I would argue only Rivian comes close, and it's probably not a coincidence that Rivian has a lot of ex-Tesla folks there, but software, I think, is just not something that most buyers really think about before the purchase, like ahead of time. 
They just discover it after they get the car. But superchargers are a huge key to the transition to sustainable transport, especially now that the network's been opened up to just about every other automaker. I mean, it hasn't actually rolled out to all the other automakers yet. That's in progress, but everybody has signed on. So Tesla, I don't have to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Keep your foot on the accelerator when it comes to superchargers, adding new ones, and just expanding existing ones. Please keep it up. And finally this week, Tesla has reportedly shelved its plans to establish a factory in Thailand. As per a recent local report, the EV maker will instead be focusing on, just like I was talking about a second ago, growing its charging network, but in Thailand. So instead of spending a bunch of money on a plant there, they're going to expand their charging network, at least for the time being, over in Thailand. One more tip of the cap to Tesla Roddy, who writes, Last year, reports emerged suggesting that the company was looking to establish a factory in Thailand. Back in November, Thailand's prime minister visited the Fremont factory, where he met with executives such as VP of Vehicle Engineering Lars Moravi. The Thailand prime minister later hinted in interviews that Tesla was considering an investment in the country. The official also hinted that Tesla was looking at three potential locations in Thailand, and that the EV maker would be investing about $5 billion into the potential project. Citing people reportedly familiar with the matter, Thai publication The Economic Base recently noted that Tesla's factory plans in the country have been shelved. The publication also claimed that Tesla's factory plans in Asia have been withdrawn for now. Instead, Tesla will reportedly be focusing on growing its charging network in Thailand. Quote, Tesla is only talking about charging stations at the moment, but the matter of setting up factories is closed, and it's not just closed in Thailand, but closed all over the world. Malaysia won't go, Indonesia won't go. They've all withdrawn, leaving only China, America, and Germany, the publication noted. And I suppose this shouldn't come as any surprise. I mean, not after Tesla publicly announced on the very recent last earnings call that they were pausing progress on Giga Mexico. I mean, with the macro economy still being what it is, I'm talking about, of course, the high interest environment that we remain in that's causing not just Tesla's production and delivery numbers to be a bit down year over year, but also everyone else's, I imagine that Tesla is not in any hurry to build any new facilities outside of what's already underway. And remember, there are a few substantial projects happening so it's not like Tesla's on any sort of expansion freeze. They're just reining it in a bit here. And what do I mean by some substantial projects happening now? Well, there's Giga Berlin. They're going to expand, probably for the Model 2.5. Giga Texas is also expanding with their data training center that's coming online now. And the biggest expansion project currently in the works of everything, or at least really by any definition, is, is the biggest project. That would be the new Tesla Semi factory at Giga Nevada, so that Tesla will be able to pump out 50,000 Tesla Semis a year once they're fully ramped up and after they get started late next year or early 2026. So Tesla is continuing to invest in its own growth, but in more specific, more targeted ways than before, which for the moment, again, in this greater macroeconomic environment, certainly makes sense. All right, that is everything I've got for you in another busy week of Tesla news. Stay tuned though, right after this short little break, I will get to some of your phone calls in the Ride the Lightning hotline coming up next. Hi, this is Franz von Holzhausen, and you're listening to Ride the Lightning with Ryan McCaffrey, the Tesla unofficial podcast. It's time for your phone calls in the Ride the Lightning hotline. If you've got a Tesla question, comment, or discussion topic for the podcast, I welcome and encourage you to call in with it. There are two easy ways to call in. The first one is to use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software. Record your question. Please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many people each week as possible. 
and then email that file to me at my Tesla podcast address, which is simply teslapodcast at gmail.com. Or you can just leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline by calling toll-free anytime. The number is 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted like I do with them, or put them onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. First up is Victor from Des Moines, Iowa. Thanks, Ryan. So I've been looking for a used Model Y, and I've been using the Tesla used inventory website. The issue I'm running into is I don't know what features individual cars have. So because Tesla doesn't do traditional model years, um, you know, I understand that they are continually updating the cars. And so it's really hard to know what features a car would even have. Um, so, for example, what type of battery it has or what type of computer it has. Um, or, you know, if there's like a change in the interior um, that I'd really like to have, but I just don't know about. Um, is there somewhere where I can look that up either using like the VIN number or something like that that shows... Oh yeah, this car has whatever feature that you might like, and this other car doesn't. You know, because I'm willing to spend a little bit more money if it's something that I really like. So, just curious if you had any thoughts on that. Thanks. That's a great question, Victor. I searched for Tesla VIN decoders, which I that was the first thing that popped into my head that I thought might be helpful here. There are several of them online, but they don't seem to do what I was hoping that they would do for your situation. They just literally decode the VIN, no false advertising there, telling you what each number and letter in the VIN means, which can be useful. It's just not what you're looking for. So does anybody out there have a good solution for this that can help Victor and maybe anybody else else out there who might be in the same situation? I, I will say the model year does give you some indication, but you're absolutely right that it doesn't necessarily tell you everything since Tesla likes to roll sometimes significant changes like, say, MCU upgrades and autopilot hardware upgrades out in the middle of a model year. So if anyone can help uh, help on this one, feel free to email me or call in. Thanks, Victor, for your call. Next up is a regular caller. Good to hear from Damon in Northbrook, Illinois. Hey, Ryan, Damon out of Northbrook, Illinois here with a quick question about the Cybertruck. Do you think that they're going to have FSD be able to support towing? Currently, no other Tesla support towing with FSD or autopilot for that matter. When you use the factory wiring harness and the car knows that it has a trailer attached, it won't let you engage FSD or autopilot. Um, Some people are able to bypass this with aftermarket wire harnesses and trailer hitches. um, But then the car doesn't know that it has a trailer behind it and it might try to make a lane change with a long trailer behind it that might sideswipe somebody. So it's not really ideal to do it. Um, And I was thinking that maybe, you know, they used to talk about the semi having uh, FSD or autopilot capability, and then they've kind of stopped talking about that. I wonder if this is a harder nut to crack than maybe they might have initially thought to have long vehicles changing lanes in traffic autonomously. Um, But i got to imagine that they're really trying to figure it out for Semi. And if they do, then hopefully that trickles down to Cybertruck and really all the towing-capable vehicles in Tesla fleet. Um, But I'm curious, do you think this will be the case? And if so, how long until they maybe are able to do it? Road tripping with FSD or autopilot is so much more comfortable and less fatiguing and therefore safer when you have the ability to just keep your eyes on the road and focus on that. And I really hope they figure this out. So I look forward to your thoughts. And as always, really appreciate your podcast and all that you do. Take care. Bye. Hey, Damon. Well, I have to say my gut says no. I hate to say that, but that is that is what my gut says. And not even for a technical reason, but rather for liability reasons. However, my one bit of optimism here comes from exactly the place that you just mentioned, that being the Tesla Semi. 
There was that story that I talked about on the podcast not too long ago about the Tesla Semi being spotted with a LiDAR hat on that gives me hope that autopilot for the Tesla Semi is indeed still going to happen and sooner rather than later. And if so, that I agree with you completely that it could trickle down to the Cybertruck in a towing scenario. If I'm being honest, I'm not very optimistic about it. And I, I hate to do that because this whole podcast, I try to be optimistic. But it, you're, you know, if I'm being honest, I'm not super optimistic here. If it does happen, I think it's probably at the bottom of the autopilot team's priority list. But I'd certainly love to see the autopilot team prove me wrong here. And again, it really just comes back to not even the technical, but the liability. Like it's one thing for a Tesla Semi where it's a corporate client, they're towing a you know fairly uniform trailer size most of the time, whereas a customer, a regular citizen with a regular driver's license driving a Cybertruck could be towing anything, could be towing like a little tiny thing with like, say, a I don't know, a kid's cyber quad. I guess that could fit in the bed, but you know, it could be towing something small or you could be towing like a giant Airstream. And I just feel like there could, there could be a liability situation there for Tesla if they allowed autopilot in that situation. So we'll see. Thank you for your call regardless. I've got time for one more call this week. It comes from Brian in Ohio with a suggestion. Hi, Ryan. This is Brian from Ohio. I wanted to call in with an interface suggestion. I don't believe this has been mentioned before, although while I am a religious listener, my memory may have failed me. So if so, please forgive me. It has to do with switching from chill mode to the standard or sport mode while driving. Uh, there are often many times where I like to go back and forth, whether I'm driving with family and I have it on chill mode or just by myself or maybe on chill mode on the highway. I need to flip into sport mode to pass someone or, you know, fill in the blank, whatever the scenario may be. Well, I know you can do that with the steering wheel buttons as well as, you know, go into the menus. It's not that deep into the menu. However, when I drive on chill mode, I notice that at the top left of the screen next to where it shows what gear you're in, it says chill. And I think it would be a clever for that to be a button, essentially, that we could press to toggle between chill and sport mode. Similar to the way with the battery percentage, you can click that to toggle between miles or percentage. So that's my thought. One click away. It would be really easy. Again, not sure if this has been suggested, but uh, maybe somebody out there will hear it who works for Tesla and make the change. Love the podcast. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. Bye-bye. You know, Brian, this is the first that I've heard of this suggestion, and I love it. I think it's a simple but effective way to make it very quick and easy to do exactly what you are suggesting without having to dig into menus while you drive. And thus, what you have proposed is a safer way to change driving modes. So let's put this out there in the hopes that the right folks at Tesla hear it. Thank you very much for calling in with your excellent UI suggestion on this one. And if anybody else out there has a good Tesla question, comment, discussion topic, whatever it may be, drop me a line, call in. I gave you the two methods to call in, the instructions for that at the top of this segment. I am by no means done with this episode of Ride the Lightning, though. Coming up next in the spirit of adventure, that would be my car, the name of my car, in my little corner of the podcast coming up uh, right after this little musical break, I finally went and test drove the new Model 3 Performance. I had waited to drive the new Model 3 at all until I could drive the Performance to make the apples to apples comparison to my car. Finally had a chance to do that. I'm gonna tell you all about that right after this. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief Sierra 117. You're listening to Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. You know, that Cybertruck looks a lot like a warthog, doesn't it? Master Chief, out. Okay, so as promised, my Model 3 performance test drive. Finally got to spend some time in the car. It's about 30 minute test drive is what the Tesla folks told me I had. So I respected that. Although when I came back, the associate that had set it up for me was busy with another customer and 
I probably could have kept the car for a while longer and nobody would have noticed, but that's okay. I had a good 30 minutes, which was which was a nice amount of time. My only bummer was when I got in the car, I noticed that it only had a 29% state of charge, which is a bit of a bummer because I knew then I wasn't getting all of the performance because the battery is the same in this car as in my car. And in the Model 3 Performance, you need to be at a, a pretty high state of charge, like 80% plus, in order to get every last drop of power that the car can give you. But moving past that, I will say first, the steering wheel on the new Model 3, and this obviously applies to all of the three freshes, not just the Performance, but the new steering wheel feels a little smaller, but I like it. It's good. I did enjoy it. The seats are just so, so noticeably better. They're, they're a big improvement. That's like, that's a massive quality of life improvement. And, and not that the, my seats are bad. The, the old Model 3 seats are not, in my opinion, bad. But these new performance seats, not only do they look really nice, but boy, are they, they hug you really good. They are an, a significant upgrade over the old seats. And the cooling functionality, the ventilation, is really awesome. That's just a such a nice thing to have. I mean, it was a good, it was a warm day. It was probably mid to upper 70s when I took the test drive. So I, I turned those cooled seats on and I was enjoying that. Uh, I noticed that sitting in the driver's seat, driving the car, the view from the driver's seat is practically the same as, as my car, aside from the accent lighting strip that runs around it, that customizable RGB light. I mean, yes, the dashboard is slightly different, like the, you know, it's a carbon fiber piece on there, but it's from the from the driver's seating position, it's very 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 similar to the to the existing Model 3, which is neither a a, a complaint or a, a a plus. It's just just an observation in this case. Let me start getting into some praise, though, because I will say the ride on this new Dynamics suspension, it's still firm like it is on my car, but I I noticed it was definitively less bumpy. I mean, it's still not like a Lexus or anything, but it's it was a noticeable improvement over my car. Uh, Performance-wise, which is probably what you're waiting to hear, because that's that was a big one for me. Is like, all right, how does this thing feel? Like when you when you let it let into it on the accelerator, what? It definitely feels like it pulls noticeably harder from zero, even though it's not that much quicker. I mean, it's two tenths of a second, but my butt dyno definitely could feel a slight difference having just gotten out of my own car and into this car. The, the part I was a little disappointed in, although this might not actually be real, and I'll explain this. So I was hoping and expecting, I had read that this would be the case, I was expecting the car to pull harder more continuously, meaning pulling harder at higher speeds, because my Model 3 performance really starts to tail off around 70 miles an hour. This one did not seem to pull much harder, if at all, at higher speed, but that might be attributable to the 85 mile an hour speed limiter that was in that was activated on this test drive car. I get why they have it there, because otherwise people would just be flying around at 100 miles an hour, and that's that's just a potentially very bad situation. But possibly because of that, the car did not seem to really pull any harder than mine does at higher speeds. So um, I'd have to drive one without the speed limiter to really get a sense of that. Uh, Audio-wise... Tesla has, they have such good sound systems. I mean, they, they have for a while. I mean, the sound system in my car is good, but th they've just gotten so much better at sound systems. And the extra subwoofer, because yes, the, the three fresh has two, my car has one. The extra sub shook the seat, my seat, in a good way. And it shook the rear view mirror hanging from the windshield. So I like the extra bass that the sound system is capable of. Here's a big one. Here's another big quality of life one. 
Compared to my 2018, I recognize that the Model 3 performance did get a little better, a little better, a little better as we went to, you know, 2020, 2021, 2023. But compared to my 2018, it is a rock solid ride in terms of there are no rattles, no squeaks. I mean, my car is pretty good, like pretty solid, but it's not perfect and it never has been. But this new one, boy, the build the build quality feels totally rock solid and it's noticeably quieter than my car, which again, not a surprise because the new one has the double pane acoustic glass all around. My car doesn't have any double pane acoustic glass. They didn't start putting that into the Model 3s. I think it was, I don't know, it was maybe 2020 or 2021 when they added it for just the front windows, not the rear. So my car has none of it. And boy, the new one is noticeably quieter. And that is very, very pleasant in the new Model 3 performance. Not unique to the performance, but again, that's what I'm comparing here. I have to say, as far as the turn signal buttons on the steering wheel versus stalks, I was totally fine with no stalks on my 30 minute test drive. Maybe that's attributable to the muscle memory that I developed from my long three day weekend with the Cybertruck earlier this year. I'm not sure. But uh, what I would say overall, my overall impressions after spending 30 minutes with the new Model 3 performance, it is definitely not a whole new car compared to my car, which in fairness, it was never really advertised as being like a radically different car. It, it's, it was billed as just a better version of the Model 3 performance, and it is. I would say it's like a, to kind of throw a software term at it, it's like a 1.2 version of my 1.0 car. And I absolutely felt super cool driving it, and I was pushing it pretty hard through some cloverleaf on-ramps and off-ramps, and it was staying planted on that staggered tire setup, but it is it is not this revelation of like, oh my God, it's a completely new car, and it's just, it blows mine away. Like, no, it's, my car is still great. The new one is a better version of it, noticeably improved in a few key areas, and uh, when I got back, to, to drop the car back off at the Tesla store, there was a demo Cybertruck, yes, a test drive Cybertruck sitting in front of the store that wasn't there when I left. And a family who had been test driving it was just getting out. And there was a young boy who was taking selfies in front of the truck on his phone, which I thought was awesome. And when I returned the Model 3 Performance inside, I asked if that Cybertruck was available to drive but of course, it was all booked up. No surprise there. But I had to ask because it would have, even though I've had the pleasure of, of driving the Cybertruck, it would have been really fun to compare these two cars that I've been considering back to back. Just drive them both one after the other immediately. But not, not this day, not on this day. But yeah, so I, I'm still pretty firm. In fact, this I would say reaffirmed my desire to get to go for the Cybertruck. I mean, I was already pretty settled on it. And it's it's not that the Model 3 performance disappointed me in any way, shape, or form. But if I were to go with it, it just, it, it compared to the Cybertruck, which is a completely new animal with the steer-by-wire and the four-wheel steering and the stainless and all that stuff, if I were to get a Model 3 performance, a new one, it, it would be very much the same experience as, the, as what I've been lucky enough to have for the last six years, just a better version of it. And I think the novelty, the newness would, would wear off pretty quickly. I mean, not that, I, not that the fun has worn off of my car, because it still hasn't. I still love getting in my car. I love driving it. I love punching the accelerator when it's safe to do so. But... It, my I, in my dream world, if I had the means, which I just don't, and that's okay. It's, but in my ideal scenario where money was not really an object, I would just I would repl I would get the new Model Three performance, but as a replacement 
for my 2018 Model 3 performance, and I'd still get the Cybertruck to replace my wife's car. That that would be the dream scenario, but that is not our situation. So it's I, I can choose one new vehicle to replace my wife's car. My 2018 Model 3 performance will be sticking around for quite a while. So I want to go with the Cybertruck, but I'm very grateful and happy to have finally had the opportunity to get some seat time in the new Model 3 performance. I want to make a recommendation to you on the entertainment side this week. I do these every now and again, and I've got a, a strong entertainment recommendation for you this week. In fact, some of you have already emailed me about this to say, hey, this I recommend this to you. And I'm gonna I'm gonna pass that on to everybody out there. And that is a new documentary on Netflix called Inside the Mind of a Dog. And not only is it just good, it's a really cool look at, at recent dog psychology, dog science, but Canine Companions, the service dog organization that I volunteer with, my family and I volunteer with, Canine Companions is heavily featured in this. And you get to see what the clients who are getting the service dog go through. It's a process called team training. So you see, you get you get a look at that. And you even, for a minute in the documentary, you get to see a puppy raiser get reunited with her puppy before graduation because her dog is graduating. She gets to see the dog for the first time in months, which is exactly what I got to go through with Zelina. So... When I watched this documentary, I was moved to tears on a few different occasions. It's because I obviously have such a personal connection to this, having gone through that process of being a part of, of raising a service dog. So you might not shed tears, but I do think that you will really, really enjoy that documentary. So check that out on Netflix. And next up this week, as we start to wind the podcast down, it's pro tip of the week time. This one comes from regular caller and loyal listener, Brian in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. So this could be considered a pro tip here. I'm not sure where you want to go with this. I know I called in probably a month, month and a half ago, probably two months ago now. Time flies, you know, uh, regarding cracked wheels and alignment issues and things of that nature. So I'm thinking I'm figuring some things out here. Um, my local garage uses a tire wheel changing machine. And it has uh, the clamps that come out and grab the, the wheel, the rim. And they always did it so it grabbed from the inside of the rim and pushed out on the rim. I was at a different garage uh, once traveling with a flat tire. And they had said to me, actually, you want to grab that wheel from the outside and push in, not from the inside and push out. And that the force of the machine pushing out can actually crack the wheel or start the crack of a wheel. So I told my local garage this, and they've been doing it from the outside in, and we have not cracked the wheel since. And it's been at least three months now, if not four months. And we were cracking a wheel way more often than that. Um, and the other thing I just learned, too, uh, alignments. I was talking to a local Pep Boys because uh, I wanted to get the alignment checked on this. My local garage didn't have time. They said they can't do a Tesla because the Teslas have sensors on them, and they, they're actually self-aligning, is what this guy told me. Whether or not this is fully true, I'm not really sure. But once, I guess, at a Tesla shop, they align, do the actual all physical alignment, then there are sensors that have to be reprogrammed to the new alignment that help keep the car in alignment. Not 100% sure on that, but if that's true, that's interesting and fascinating, and I would love to know more about that. Thanks again, and keep up the great work. Thank you, Brian. I'm not so sure about the alignment sensor situation that you mentioned at the end there. I've had my car aligned a couple times now, but I've always had it done by Tesla themselves in my case. So if anybody out there can authoritatively speak to this, I would certainly appreciate it. But I am playing your call as a pro tip, because I do think that your wheel cracking ordeal, which listeners might remember from a few months ago when I played your first phone call about it, can be learned from now that you were able to get to the bottom of it with the help of another tire shop there. So, Brian, thank you very much for sharing that hard-won knowledge. 
And if anybody else out there has a good Tesla pro tip of the week that you'd like to share with me and your fellow Tesla owners and enthusiasts, you can call in with that the same way that you call in to the regular Ride the Lightning hotline, which I gave you the instructions for earlier in the podcast. Before I go this week, I'll mention some friends of Ride the Lightning that can hopefully be of use to you at some point. Starting with abstractocean.com, I do have their website pulled up. I just want to read you a few of the best sellers, the things that a lot of people are getting and loving that you might find useful for your car as well. They offer premium Model 3 mud flaps for the new Model 3 that are actually on sale. These are $55, free delivery for orders over $125. Okay, so that's cool. They have the rim trims, which are the band that goes on the outer edge of your wheel so that if you were to accidentally hit the curb, it would hopefully just eat into that rim trim rather than your actual wheel. They have three different colors available for that. They have a full color animated LED dash light strip for the old threes and Ys that don't have the the accent lighting strip built in. If you'd like to get that, that's on sale. Of course, the ultra premium tempered glass screen protectors, those are 50 bucks. Those are always a, a big one I tend to mention every week. All kinds of lighting kits, etc. It just it goes on, so I'm not gonna read you every single product on their site, but if you want to stop by at some point, it's abstractocean.com. Click on whichever car you own, and it will show you all of the products available for it. And anything that you like, throw it into your online shopping cart, and then when you get to checkout, Use the coupon code RTL Podcast, all one word, to get 15% off of your first order. That's RTL Podcast, all one word, no spaces, for 15% off your first order at abstractocean.com. And then there's the Snap Plate and the newer Snap Plate Plus, available for S3, X, and Y. Get yours at everyamp.com slash RTL. And don't forget the discount code. RTL on that one. That's the front license plate bracket that I recommend rather than the one that Tesla gives you because the one that Tesla gives you attaches to the car via automotive adhesive, meaning if you ever want to take it off, you're going to have a bad time and you are you might be left with a bad situation uh, on your car in terms of sticky tape residue and can you get it off without scratching the paint, etc. So just get the snap plate if you either want to have a front plate on your car and or are legally required to have a front license plate on your car. The snap plate is safety optimized with breakaway features to sacrifice itself in a worst case scenario. The snap plate plus is strength optimized with hardened features for maximum strength. Both both have the signature minimalist aesthetic that blends in perfectly with the Tesla front end and both are made from recycled made in the USA plastics with stainless steel reinforcements. Again, get yours at everyamp.com slash RTL, and don't forget the coupon code RTL. If you're considering solar on your home or business or both, I heartily encourage you to keep budgetsafesolar.com on your short list of suppliers that you're considering, or providers, I guess. Provider, supplier, same, you know what I'm talking about. Budgetsafesolar.com. They now offer home battery storage as part of their solar installation. So yes, you can get the new Tesla Powerwall 3 with your installation if you want. So check them out. The website again is budgetsafesolar.com. And if you do proceed with an installation at your home or business, please use the referral code RTL. Immaculate Reflections. If you're in or going to be in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, I wholeheartedly recommend that you bring your car, your Tesla or some other car in your garage that you love, bring it to Immaculate Reflections, and when you pick it up, when Immaculate Reflections is done with it, you are going to be stoked. I guarantee it. Trust me on this one. I've <laughs> I've lived it multiple times. Every time I go there, whether it's to, you know, get a touch up on something or, you know, when I've had the paint protection film damage and get the get that piece of film redone. I always am always happy when I go get my car from Immaculate Reflections. So there's a nice Ride the Lightning listener discount here as well. All you got to do is reach out through the website, which is irdetailing.com. You want to call, you want to reach out, you want to get on the schedule because they do book up. 
So whether you're doing ceramic coating, paint protection film, or paint correction, or some combination thereof, whatever you want to do, they will work with you on your budget and what you're trying to do, what your goals are for your car. IRDetailing.com is the website. My Patreon, I mentioned it earlier in the podcast, but I'll mention it one more time here. It's patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. And that is the way that you can choose to support the podcast. If you'd like to give something back, the Patreon is the way to do it. I would be sincerely grateful if you chose to do so. Maybe this is the week. Maybe you've been listening for a while and you decided, you know what? Yes, I've been listening for a while. I enjoy the podcast. I'm going to join the Patreon. I would really thank you for doing that. And other ways that I more tangibly thank you than just mentioning it on the podcast is by offering you some perks and rewards at the different support tiers. So the base support tier is just five bucks a month. You can join the Patreon for just five bucks a month. And if you do that, you'll get early access to each week's podcast. If you step up to the most popular tier, that's the $10 per month tier, you'll get the early access and you'll get access to not only every one of those lightning round mini episodes that I've already done, it's over a hundred of them, but you'll get access to each one I do, each new one I do every single week on Patreon. So check it out, patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. I would be very appreciative if you take a look. You can subscribe slash follow this podcast totally for free on whatever podcast service you prefer. Statistically, for most of you, it's Apple Podcasts, but there's also TuneIn and Spotify and YouTube Podcasts. The best way to find me on any of those is just to search for Ride the Lightning Tesla. You should find me easily that way. And then you can click follow or subscribe, and what that will do is... Every time there's a new episode, which with this podcast, it's every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific, you will get a push notification that a new episode is available so that you don't have to remember to go get it. Your phone or your device will remind you. Finally, you can follow me on Twitter slash X and or Instagram at the same username on either one. It's DMC underscore Ryan. You can email me anytime about Tesla stuff at teslapodcast at gmail.com. And uh, finally, I'll say hello and thank you to the top tier Patreon backers. I'll start with that top tier, the Roadster in Space tier. They are Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, Victoria Iacoveto, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, who I'll be talking to one-on-one this weekend. Uh, the Roadster and Space Tier folks get a one-on-one hangout with me each month if they elect to choose it. Kara Weston, Robert from near Philly, Kristen Rumble, American Home Contractors, GetAmber.com, and Doug Carey. And I talked to Doug last weekend. We had a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much to you ultra-generous Roadster in Space tier backers. Next up, the Maximum Plaid backers. Last weekend, we had our August Patreon Zoom hangout. Had a fantastic time chatting with everybody, as we always do. It's always a, it's a fun group conversation about all things Tesla. Big thanks to the Maximum Plaid backers. They are Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from New York City, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisneski, Gil Cabrera, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Corey O'Donnell, Aaron, John Cody. John, congratulations on your cyber beast. John just took a big, long road trip in his Cyber Beast and and posted about it in our open discussion chat on Patreon, um, which by that's like a newer thing. There's like a cool, like just open, open chat discussion thing, which is there's been there's been a lot of good chatter in there. So, John, it was super fun reading about your road trip adventures. Thank you as well to Joel Sapp, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, 
KB, Adam Lavoy, contact1callcenter.com, Jason Chalukas, Travis Krenzel, Bruce Otterstein, Tom Behan, Josh Pennington, John from Cream Ridge, New Jersey, Dustin Hart, Michael Gallo, Derek Finley, Charles Clement, Rav, Adam Christie, Damon Klein, and Jeff Brown. Finally, I'd like to say a hello and thank you to the Plaid Level supporters. This tier is officially no more, but these very kind folks continue to pledge at that level, and so they get all the perks and bonuses that they should get, including getting their name shouted out at the end of each week's podcast. So a big thanks and a hello goes out to George Cassiopo, Logan Willis, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, the Tesla Owners Club of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, Dennis Peake, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, the Lydia Family, Aaron Altshul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Ish, not Elon Musk in quotes, Peter and the Bear Boys of Colorado, Bear spelled B-A-E-R, the Bear family. Thanks to all of you who are kindly supporting the podcast at any of the various tiers on my Patreon. You are helping me out in a big way, me and my family in a big, big way, and I do sincerely appreciate it. It is how this podcast can continue to happen every single week, and I'm super proud that I have delivered a podcast literally every single week since I started it 472 episodes ago. All right, for a snoring Daisy the Boxer and a quietly snoozing Mine of the Future service dog puppy, my name is Ryan McCaffrey, of course. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to listen this week. As you do each week, it means a lot that you would spend your valuable time here sharing in this enthusiasm for all things Tesla with me. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Happy electric motoring, and I'll see you back here next week. Elon Musk, people don't like Elon Musk. The guy founded PayPal and Tesla, and people are like, yeah, but he's a troll and a bad dad. I'm like, so was mine. He did nothing to fight climate change. (laughs) Also, have you been in a Tesla? Have you been in a Tesla? My buddy let me drive his Tesla. I laughed out loud at how fast it went. Been clinically depressed my entire life, on dozens of medications, in a Tesla for 13 seconds, cured forever. (laughs) I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make, it's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.